warm welcome, Derek Singleton. <laughs> welcome. Well, thanks everybody. Good morning. Um, it's exciting to be here. It's kind of surreal, actually, to uh, be staring at a group of students and um, figuring out what I'm going to tell you. So I figured I'll just uh, tell the story the way it's been, and hopefully you'll find it um, inspiring on some level and groundbreaking for your own thinking in some other ways. Um, he's right. I, I started off. Um, in an unconventional way, but I'll get to that in a minute. This is one of the uh, things that I live by, and it's carried me through my entire career since I was here at UCF, actually, as well. Um, it's a Hunter S. Thompson quote, and um, the edge, there is no honest way to explain it, because the only people who really know where it is are the ones who have gone over. And every time I read that, I get re-inspired um, because I've tried to make a career out of finding where the edge is, um, trying not to go over it too many times, but um, I have, I think, technically. And um, that's an interesting place to be, to uh, challenge yourselves. Because in a world of information, um, everything has a purpose. Everything is connected. Now, I know this sounds a little bit like Oh yeah, we've heard this before, but um, this is really how I see the world. I've seen it since I was here, and it's been, uh, it's been hugely beneficial for me to look at things this way during um, my career. So you should ask yourself, as you enter into this world of information, what your job will be or what you think you want to do, what, what dreams you have and what visions you have for yourselves as you, uh, as you leave UCF and uh, embark on a career. I believe that your job is to find where the edge is. It's to take chances. I think that's what engineering and computer science is really all about. It's, for me, it is not about um, doing what you're told necessarily, but if you are told to do something within the context of that, ask yourself, what can I do beyond this assignment? How can I do this differently? And again, this may sound like simple rhetoric, but it's not, because you're going to face a lot of pressures in the real, wor real world that you do not face here at the university. Uh, pressures of performance, uh, failure that can lead to job loss, um, failure that can lead to lots of things. So in the face of all that, you're going to find yourselves continually having to challenge your own thinking to push yourself to find the edge and go over it. Your job is to innovate it's to fail your way to success, and it's to create new things. It's only by doing that that this industry moves forward. It doesn't move forward by copying someone else's work or by not taking chances and by not innovating. Again, if some of these phrases you've heard before, I apologize, but they are, they are tried and true, um, and I carry them around with me in my mind almost every single day, is to find the edge to find where the failure point is and to not be afraid to risk that because when you do, that's where your greatest successes will lie, I can promise you. The greatest achievements in your career are going to be the ones that you discover by taking huge chances and finding the edge and not being afraid of failure. So when you think you've imagined something that's a, a future, my uh, ask for you is to go further than that and is to go until it's beyond your imagination. I've had the benefit of working with, for years, some of the world's most amazing thinkers, and I never ever thought when I graduated UCF that my career would turn out the way it did. Um, I'll talk a little bit more and add some color to that in a moment, but uh, again, I can assure you that uh, some of the people I've met and worked with, the reason they are where they are is simply because they were always finding that edge, always pushing themselves and not being afraid to innovate or take chances. Steve Jobs said that you can't just ask customers what they want and then try to give that to them. By the time you get it built, they'll want something new. How many of you have heard that quote before? Okay. Uh, I think it's true. You know, Think about the products that you admire the most and that are in most of your pockets right now from Apple. You know, every time something came out from Apple or another innovative company and we looked at it and thought, 
how would I use this? And then six months or 12 months later, the, the question is, how could I not use this? How could I imagine my life without it? You know that that person pushed themselves into that world of imagining beyond the future and really looking ahead. I wrote a piece once for um, a magazine called Client Server Journal years ago. And that particular issue, a friend of mine, um, Mary Fran Johnson, had interviewed Steve Jobs and Bill Gates together. And I don't know if it was that particular interview, but the comment was uh, back from Bill that um, Steve is always 10 years ahead in his thinking. And I never forgot that, because 10 years is a long time <laughs> in the tech world. And I believe that if we strive to always place ourselves there, that we'll get some benefit out of it here. Um, I believe that you've chosen the best industry in the world, engineering and anything around it. Because you can build anything for anyone. It's entirely up to you. There's no limit to what you can do. You're living in a time where the tools that are presented to you to build and create are some of the best in human history. You're living in a time when the portability to execute and use those tools is the best in human history. We have architectures and things happening that enable you to do things that I could only dream about when I was at school here. Fortunately, I'm still alive <laughs> and still participating, so I get to, to live some of that dream myself. And this is kind of leading up to uh, what I really want to talk about, is that you're in a field where you can live 10 lifetimes in one because technology is portable. And what I mean by that is you do not need to limit yourself to whatever corporation or startup or organization you become a part of as you graduate and let that define where you're going in your career. Because technology and information is is boundless. You can take the skills you've learned and take your creativity and pack it up in an imaginary bag and go anywhere you want to and contribute in great ways to any organization, company, or idea that you may have on your own. Not all fields uh, give you that possibility. I mean, you could argue that in the field of medicine, you can certainly have many options, but it's not as portable and I think widely applicable as information, engineering, and computer science is. So, Obviously, I'm tremendously biased, but, <laughs> but that's my belief. Now, here's an example of a highlight or a snapshot of my career. When I left UCF, I um, graduated at a time where the Cape around the corner had just gone through a layoff. And the, this area was flooded with experienced engineers and computer scientists. So it was pretty tough to get a job up against someone who owned a house and had a family and was probably willing to perhaps work for less and had 10 years experience over a graduating student. So those of us that were in the class of 86 were somewhat struggling with that. And um, as a result, I had to widen my, my circle of, of looking for work. In the end, I um, received an offer from Lockheed Martin and one from a small company down in Miami and one from the Orange County Property Appraisers Office in, in Orlando. And I promised myself when I was here that I would never work for county government or city government or any government. So, um, I, but I went on the interview because uh, I wanted to, to work and you don't turn down interviews. So when I got there, um, the offices were, were kind of that government green color, you know, and uh, it was already depressing within the first 10 seconds. So I'm like, why am I here? And um, I met with this gentleman who was the hiring manager and he said, uh, I know what you're thinking, you know, and I'm like, I bet you do. <laughs> and he said, you're right. The building isn't much to talk about. The computing, the computing system is a Burroughs mainframe, which I'd read about, but I'd never seen one. And um, he said, it's kind of ancient. So why are we interviewing? And um, I, I thought, he's reading my mind, you know. And um, he said, we're interviewing because we may get funding from the state of Florida to really really make a significant step forward in our computing environment here at Orange County. And if we get the funding, many, many millions of dollars, then we're going to build something really fantastic. And we'll build a new computing center, the all new equipment, we have to build new networks, everything has to go from, from almost you know, ground zero. And he said, um, you're like the fifth person we've interviewed. So suddenly the light bulb went off in my head. And the light bulb was, this is a big if, but if this guy gets his funding, and if I get this job, then I'll be 
right up there with like the first half dozen people hired for this new computing center. And more importantly than that, how often do you get to build a really big computer center from ground zero? It never works like that. You either get a job at a corporation and everything's already built and maybe you get to tack something on, or you do a startup, in which case you don't get to build a big computing environment usually unless you're extremely lucky. So this might be a great opportunity. So anyway, I was offered the job and um, I accepted it. I was also offered the job from Lockheed Martin, but I turned it down. And the reason I did that was, again, I'd rather be, I thought, you know, one of a small group of people building something possibly amazing than one of a large group of people working on something already amazing, the space shuttle. So I, um, fortunately he got his funding or I probably wouldn't be here right now, <laughs> to be honest. But the money came through and I spent the next uh, several years uh, with what seemed to a young person like an unlimited budget to just create this real life laboratory of stuff um, that I could see the impact of on a daily basis as I drove around Orlando. And it was literally one of the most exciting jobs I've ever had um, because Orange County's funding didn't stop that year. It kept coming every year. And um, from, built, from buying a new 10-story building to putting in you know, uh, a wide area network across the town and um, you name it, really, there was everything you could think of in that, in that uh, architecture to the software, to the fact that the organization grew right underneath me to a very, very large organization. Um, it was the springboard for the rest of my career. I left and went to Honeywell after Orange County. And uh, part of that is attributable to um, a woman who uh, recruited me. She worked for a company called uh, Hydric and Struggles. And uh, we met at the, Orange, at the uh, Orlando airport and I felt very, very smug and secure in my life. I was in the top position at Orange County for IT. Um, I wasn't 30 yet. And I had a place on the beach in Melbourne Beach. I also had a startup I was working on, so I was feeling pretty sure of myself, you know. And um, she looked me straight in the eye and she said, you need to leave this job. She said, the time has come. If you stay here much longer, you'll be branded, you know, as as a government employee, if in fact you want to migrate to the commercial space. Now there's nothing wrong with being a government employee, um, nothing at all. But she knew that's not what I originally dreamed about when I left UCF. So thankfully you'll, you will also meet amazing mentors in your career like, like her, uh, Joey Greger. And um, she essentially yanked me out of Orange County and helped me secure um, one of the top IT jobs at uh, Allied Signal, now Honeywell. And that's where things really started to happen. Um, I'm not going to talk for many, many minutes about each one of these items, but there's a trend here, and that's what I'm trying to share with you. Part of the trend is to keep finding the edge, of course, and the edge isn't just in the technology, it's in your career, too challenge everything you've ever been taught, start to rely on your own thinking, and you'll start to build kind of an inventory of positive experiences that you know will work for you and that define who you are, not only as an engineer, but as a business person. So when I got to um, Honeywell, um, you know, the challenge was amped up considerably. Now I'm in a commercial environment, a for-profit company, head of a uh, growing IT division and engineering division in the aerospace group. And um, no one's there to tell you how to do that. When you get into that position, it's really up to you. So all the things I learned at Orange County, some of them at UCF, and a lot of what I was teaching myself and learning from some great mentors started to fit and come together in the Honeywell experience. I was there for about, um, I guess, just over four years in the aerospace group, in the automotive group, um, as head of information technology, and at the aerospace as head of uh, engineering. And we probably don't have time to go into everything a company can teach you, but 
your education continues, obviously, after school. And um, if you're lucky, companies will invest in you and you'll learn techniques and uh, disciplines and other things that make you stronger. I think the best thing that you'll ever learn is to attach yourself to the right mentors as you, as you work your way through your career and don't be afraid to do so. Because one of the things I found early on is the number of people that don't ask if they can do something is remarkable. It is incredibly easy to move your way through corporate ranks, in my view, or startup ranks, or your own ranks, simply by asking yourself or asking someone else, do you mind if I do this? Do you mind if I take this cluster of mainframes and just experiment over the weekend and migrate them towards a um, microcomputer infrastructure? I just want to see what happens if I pull all the software off of this computing center's infrastructure and move it to a, you know, a cluster of microcomputers, for example. Um, no, go ahead and do that. We don't care. Do you mind if I start this software project at Honeywell, which would enable collaborative engineering across the world? Um, it'll be microcomputer based. We'll interleave it into Microsoft's office system so that people have a familiarity with the interface so that they just kind of gently ease into this model. And we believe that if we do that, we can shorten the life cycle of the software development by four or five or six hundred percent and cut the cost accordingly. No, we don't mind if you do that. Go ahead and do that. Um, I think when you ask permission in, in your career and look for all the right sign-offs to get something done, you'll find yourself not getting it done. There's an old saying, ask forgiveness, not permission. I live by that one too. So find the edge, go over it, ask forgiveness, don't ask permission, and be your own person. <laughs> That's probably half of, the, uh, half of the summary here for today. So after Honeywell, um, we we're going through a series of acquisitions and divestitures. Um, I was ready to go to my next uh, location with Honeywell, and um, I decided to stay in the mid-Atlantic area and ended up briefly at, uh, at Columbia Energy Group for about a year. And the company was taken over um, in, a, in a takeover by a bigger company, hence the, uh, the short life cycle of that job. Um, I was CIO there. And um, then I went over to Raytheon. Now Raytheon started to, to get a little close to the original starting point of the, the government kind of mentality. But um, I was working with a gentleman named Dan Burnham there, who was our uh, chairman of the board. And uh, we'd worked together at, at Allied Signal. And he gave me the opportunity to start the e-commerce division at Raytheon. It was either a CIO opportunity or, hey, let's try this new thing called e-commerce. Um, and at the time, I was pretty interested in, in that idea because uh, chief information officers uh, often do very similar things at every company they go to. So I was excited to do something different. He had, um, I guess, had lunch with Bill Gates a few days before. And Bill had uh, gotten inside his head and explained to him that he really needed to do something with the internet. And um, about a week or two later, uh, I was calling Dan as I was trying to make the transition from Columbia Energy to somewhere else and um, due to the, the uh, takeover. And that's when we had the conversation. Um, I remember writing down Burnham's number as he called me on the inside my house, which was being constructed at the time. And I often think today about somewhere underneath a few layers of paint um, in that house is Burnham's number, the guy who called me and said, start the e-commerce division at Raytheon, um, because that was a really transformational experience. The company was uh, about $26 billion at the time, and um, the pressures, I think, were exciting in that Raytheon had uh, numerous product lines, had never done anything with the internet, and I had to live down the endless joke of that we were going to sell Patriot missiles on the web. So um, I was able to put a great team together, um, build out e-commerce for Raytheon, and we spent uh, a number of years um, expanding into the commercial space, um, moving uh, everything from classified information over the web, which was a new uh, technology challenge, to selling airplane parts and creating uh, you know, some huge B2B exchanges and all the stuff that you probably know about that happened during that era. Um, I was on a uh, business trip with Raytheon in Belfast, Northern Ireland, uh, setting up a software center um, in Derry, Ireland. 
And um, I don't know if it was the weather or, or what the situation was, but it was a pretty dismal trip, um, kind of depressing. And uh, everybody just wanted to really wrap things up and come back to the States. And I was, um, we were partnering with a company called Price Waterhouse uh, at the time as consultants. And one of the folks that was working for Price Waterhouse um, had this pair of eyeglasses. They were um, sunglasses, actually. And we were in the car heading back to the airport, and she put them on. And I, I thought, these are really nice. I said, uh, those are nice sunglasses. What's the brand? And she said, uh, they're Robert Mark. Robert Mark makes them. And I'd never heard of that because I didn't know anything other than you know, um, Ray-Bans and pretty limited knowledge of eyewear. But I'd been sailing a lot at the time. One of my hobbies is, is yacht racing. And um, all I could think about was that these were really cool frames. They kind of wrapped around the side a little bit. And I thought of my crew and how this would be great in really sunny environments for sailing. So I said, well, how much do they cost? And she said, oh, they're pretty expensive, um, like $500 a pair, you know? And I'm like, oh my gosh, that's not going to work out. There's 40 guys on the team, you know? So um, she said, but I know Robert Mark. He's a friend of mine. I said, OK. She said, um, you know, you guys should meet. I think you'd like each other. And I said, she goes, I know you pretty well. And I know him pretty well. And uh, I'm, I'll make that happen. He's in New York. So I said, sure, no problem. All I could think about was how am I going to get these sunglasses for 40 guys and for free, you know? <laughs> so um, anyway, she set up the meet. I met him. And um, this is my you know, being thrown into the frying pan of the apparel, fashion, and retail world story. And uh, we met, and I was wearing glasses at the time. And the first thing he said to me was that they were so three years ago that he couldn't stand it. So I thought, OK, a fashion designer, of course. He said, before we talk, I, we have to do something about it. So I said, all right. So we go down to one of his stores, and um, the people in the store were kind of surprised to see Robert Mark himself coming into the store with someone. So he said, I need a few minutes. I need a few minutes. This is Eric Singleton. We're going to pick him out some frames. And I said, uh, OK. So he picked out three pairs, and he tried them on me. And he said, there, that's better. And I'm like, all right, great. You know, <laughs> Where is this going? So um, we marched back up to his office. And we talked a little bit about this and a little bit about that. And he said, you're a computer guy, right? I love that. Your whole career, you're going to hear, you're a computer guy or you're a computer person, or you're an engineer, right? As if that defines you, you know, that's it. So you can fix my computer. So I said, yeah, I'm a computer guy, um, sure. And uh, he said, well, I'm having some issues with my computer system. And if you would uh, take a look at it, um, that would really help me out. Now, of course, he was a smart guy. He just gave me three pairs of these $500 a pair frames. And I felt indebted to him. So naturally, I was going to say yes. So I said, sure, I'll, I'll check things out. And um, I met with some of his folks. And they had some baseline problems and things like that. And we struck up an arrangement to um, have me fix everything for him and get a team in there. And, but it occurred to me at that moment, I met with him for a few weeks after that. I had to disclose to Raytheon, I'm doing some things on the side for this fashion designer person, but there's no competition here. And they were cool with it. And, um, it dawned on me the, that I'd been spending my career in Orange County, where I had this insane budget um, for an IT engineer person anyway. Um, and we, could do, we did amazing things there. And then I went to Honeywell, and we did amazing things there. Because these are big companies with huge missions, lots of dollars, and the ability to kind of if you ask, or if you don't ask, and you just drive forward, you can do amazing things, because nobody's really going to stop you. Um, and then Raytheon. And each one of these places had brilliant manufacturing techniques, tremendously expert staffs, and resources galore. So anything you thought of, if, it didn't take much to find the right team and put them together and execute against your ideas. But in the apparel and fashion world, I was suddenly discovering that they were really, really way behind when it came to um, the places I'd been. And I thought, well, maybe it's just this one company. But I got to sniff around a little bit while I was in New York, and it wasn't just the one company. It was this whole industry. Um, 
And then this light bulb went off in my head. Now, all this happened within two weeks of that trip to Belfast, Ireland. So I realized right then I wanted to make a career change. And this goes back to how portable everything you're learning here at the university is. I thought this would be easy. I thought, OK, I'm going to start to make um, headway into leaving Raytheon and get into this really cool fashion space because, number one, it's very cool. And number two, um, it's like bringing cavemen fire in terms of the technology part. So I could look really good without too much effort. And um, we'll see what happens. So I did the usual thing. I went, uh, started dialing up some recruiters and sniffing around the industry and all that. And um, only to find I'd been branded as a corporate heavy manufacturing engineering type person. You, I mean, you're not in apparel, you're not in fashion, you're not in music, so you're not allowed to participate with the rest of us anymore. Sorry about that. I mean, it was really kind of the vibe. It was, you've spent, what, seven, eight, yeah, you know, you spent uh, 14 years doing this other stuff, so it's too late. And I was like, well, that, that's not how America works. I mean, you, you've got, I'll figure it out somehow. You know, I was getting pretty frustrated. So, um, so I left Raytheon, and I started a consulting company. I figured if nobody's going to hire me, then I'll start my own company and see what happens. And um, I'll start doing these Robert Mark-like things, being the computer guy, for these other fashion companies and these apparel companies. And I started doing that. And I found out that the industry is a very intimately connected industry. So one person would kind of lovingly refer you to the next one. It was weird. It wasn't like they would share their computer person um, and be afraid of the other person getting a step up on them and crushing them with technology or anything like that, which is the way I would think. But they're just like, hey, I know this person and his company. They're really good. Try them out. And, um, this started working. I was pretty happy about it. I was actually um, making a living out of it, you know? And um, I got this phone call one day, about six months in, and uh, it was an executive at Tommy Hilfiger had called. So they said, would you come down and talk to us about um, doing Tommy.com? We know you're at Raytheon. I did the e-commerce program for a number of years. We hear you're on your own now. We hear you're starting to make make some headway into the uh, apparel industry here in New York, so come and talk to us. So I tried to sound cool on the phone, like it was just another, you know, yeah, Polo called five minutes before you, but um, <laughs> of course I was freaking out because I thought this could be it, you know. Nobody knows who Robert Mark is. Nobody in this room knew who Robert Mark was probably when I mentioned it, but everybody knows who Tommy Hilfiger is. So I was very excited. So I zipped down to um, Tommy Hilfiger headquarters and uh, started talking to a few folks, the interview process, if you will. But this was for consulting. So all I could think about was, here comes my contract, if I don't blow it, to build timey.com. If I'm really lucky, I can get them to put the credits at the bottom of the page of our little company. This is who built the site. That was in my head, you know? We could do something really innovative. Put them on the map, put us on the map, okay. So I, things were going pretty well, and um, I think they, if I remember correctly, they said, can you stay another day? So I thought, that's good. Sure. So I booked the room for another night, came back the next day, and uh, in the end they said, we'd like you to meet our CEO, David Dyer. And um, I thought, that's great. How could that be a wrong thing? So um, I was delighted to have that opportunity, so I went to Mr. Dyer's office, and there he was. And I was all prepared to uh, do everything I could to land this this contract. And um, my recollection of this event, by the way, uh, is we talked and he said, well, I really need a CIO for this company. And um, he said, but if you'd like to do the website as a consultant, that's OK, too. It's really kind of up to you. So here I am. I thought, I never saw that one coming. I put all this effort into starting this company, and I think I'm going to get this really great contract, 
And he said I could still do that, but he's putting out there, would you like to be CIO for Tommy Hilfiger because I've looked at your resume and I noticed you've been a CIO a few times before and that's really what I need. So I, I thought to myself, wow, I really have to think about this for like more than about an eighth of a second. So I thought, eh. I said, um, okay, CIO role sounds great. So he said, great, great. He goes, now I expect the website to be built in six months. You can do that, right? So, so, so he kind of got me and um, I accepted this role and it was just, it was just electrifying. I mean, it was great to be making the transformation from government, heavy manufacturing, aerospace defense, automotive, and all that into a world that I'd been introduced to about six months before where the standard uh, mode of entry was a closed door. So think about that. And I think through fate and my own efforts, and just like in your career, it will be through your own efforts, a door opened up. I was able to seize upon it and um, have my career really, really start in apparel at Tommy Hilfiger. I won't go into all the details there. There's many and um, very exciting ones at that. But there was a moment where I was sitting in Tommy's office one afternoon and I looked out, um, out the window. I could see the Hudson and we were doing some exciting stuff. I think it couldn't have been a week before that. Um, I'd had a conference call with, uh, with Dave, Steve Ballmer, our COO, and myself, because we were setting the stage for what Tommy.com was going to become. And it was a great call, the, the phone call was. And uh, we knew that Steve was going to be coming down to New York, and we had some events that we were going to do together. I was really, really heavy uh, in touch with Microsoft during that period. And um, I truly looked out the window as I was alone in, in Tommy's office, and I thought, this is pretty good for a kid from UCF in Orlando, Florida, to get to this point. And I just thought, people don't expect necessarily um, the things that happen to them in their career, but I think there comes a point when you reflect back on it a little bit and allow yourself one, one brief moment to, um, feel good about yourself and what you've done and, and what you're doing and where it's all going to go. And I had that moment, um, unknown to him, I'm sure, in his office that day. <laughs> and um, after that, uh, the company was sold to a private equity firm. Um, sadly, a bunch of us left. I went on to consult with Microsoft uh, after that and then really uh, kind of resumed the consulting um, efforts of my company post Tommy Hilfiger, only this time we had a leg up um, for all the years we had been there. And um, that went on for a number of years and very successfully. And then I decided it would be interesting to go back into corporate America, if you will. So here's the funny part of the whole story. At least it's funny to me. I was living in the mid-Atlantic region. This is very recent. And um, started working for some of the local companies. Now in the mid-Atlantic near DC, there's a lot of defense contractors. So I thought, okay, had all those years working for Honeywell, manufacturing, I know all the process models, I'm certified all over the place, this should be a no-brainer. I'll just cruise down to DC and try to land some more defense-oriented, you know, heavy equipment, heavy manufacturing type projects for my, my consulting company thinking that would be a drop in the bucket. I re really thought this would be like two afternoons at best and I'd walk away with a bunch of business because I hadn't focused on that area in a while but had the background. So I met with a very large consulting company I will not name and uh, had a nice lunch, a lot of discussion. This went on for a couple of days. And in the end, they said, well, we really want to work with you guys at Altair Star, that's my company. But you're not really, I mean, you're kind of fashion people, right? You know, you don't know much about I, I, defense. And I was like, you gotta be kidding me. So I get 10 years into this apparel industry and suddenly it's erased this first part of my, my branding of my career. And the odd part was that during the meetings that we were having, it was very evident that nothing, and I mean nothing had changed 
in the DOD space. The terminology was the same. The process models were the same. It was like a time warp. And yet, I guess in their mind, I was now a fashion apparel technology engineer, not one of them anymore. Whereas a few years before, it was the other way around. So then I, I realized right then, this is all insane. It doesn't matter. Do what you want. When you want to do it, it's up to you. I've lived it, I know. Um, my entree into Chico's FAS, because my heart is in apparel, I will say. Um, there's somewhat of a story there. I'll, I'll, I'll skip over it, but I will get to this point. Um, truly honored to be at Chico's, and I'll tell you why. I've only been there for like nine weeks now as um, head of technology and applications. But some of the best people I ever worked with were at Tommy Hilfiger. And I often was very sad that that gig had ended. But I understand it's business. The company had, had been sold and so on and so forth. That's what happens. Still doesn't erase you reflecting back warmly, thinking those are some amazing people I worked with. So when I had the opportunity to work for David Dyer, again, I had to pinch myself. He's the CEO of Chico's FAS and was the CEO at Tommy Hilfiger, um, who offered me the CIO position there. So I really couldn't have dreamed of that happening for round two. And uh, the band being back together, if you will, at least from my point of view, making another record. But um, that's kind of where we're at. So at Chico's, um, the opportunities are boundless. It's focused on apparel. Um, and much in the same way I discovered on that uh, afternoon with Robert Mark years before, there's still a huge opportunity for change and impact, and um, I couldn't be happier. So don't listen to anyone who will tell you in your career it's not possible. I'm primarily speaking about the engineering and software side of things, but don't listen to anybody tell you anything isn't possible, because everything is possible. I've made a career out of changing corporations, re-engineering almost everything in them from a technical point of view, doing it in a fast and furious manner that excites me and the teams that I work with. I've challenged the norm for over 20 years, failed my way to success, found out where the edge was, and I can tell you that the people that I've had the honor to do that with, we all feel the same way. I think what keeps us excited and gives us energy and passion is that you never really find where the edge is ever. You're always seeking it. You might get a glimpse of it for a moment, but then it, it retreats and you have to find it again. So everything is possible. You just need to find the way because it's there. It's there technically. It's there financially. Everything. So if a company is not going to hire you and you're passionate enough, do it yourself. You'd be amazed how that can work out very, very well for, for you. Your career is going to change several times in your lifetime. And if it doesn't, I think you're missing out. I think if you end up at a company and you stay there your whole career, there's nothing wrong with that. But I think if you don't make some changes as you roll through your career, you're going to miss out on some incredible opportunities. When I made the transition, in essence, from Raytheon in the middle and then to Tommy Hilfiger, it wasn't that easy by any means. There was many days and many nights where I wasn't sure of what I was doing. But you know, I had some great friends, and there was always someone there to encourage me to keep pushing forward. And then a remarkable thing happened. I thought I had this great career before Hilfiger, and I did. But it wasn't anything in comparison to what happened when the doors opened up for me in the apparel industry. So you never know when those doors are going to open up. So you should always, always think, if you get burned out or it gets boring, shake yourself up. You know, Rattle your own cage and find your way to a new beginning, or else you are missing out. You're leaving here with a suitcase full of tools to conquer the world. You need to believe that and believe in yourself, because you really have everything you need when you graduate UCF. 
to do anything you want to do, especially in this career of engineering and computer science. I think the university has taught us all the basics, but the rest is up to you. I strongly recommend being a pioneer, being fearless, and driving forward with your own ideas and not letting anyone discourage you. The world is counting on you. You can make a difference and um, expect it of yourself. That's my presentation. <laughs> Against my better judgment, I'm going to ask you a question. We ought to just leave right now. That's yeah. amazing. Thank you. Oh, it's okay. Well, thanks. Very powerful. Thank you very much. Um, so these guys are going to be leaving in a year or two, mm -hmm. and they're going to have that first job. And you, they just listened to you, and you, and you said, guys, go push that edge. Mm -hmm. So before they go push that edge, how do they go to their boss, or what do they need to do before they push it? And let's say they did push it, and it didn't quite work. How do they recover? So how do these guys really go push the edge? Remember when you were in their shoes? Um, how do you do that if, if things don't work out? Yeah. Just ask, a, just come back the next day and ask again. <laughs> that would be one way to do it. Uh, let's see, I was six months into my job at Orange County and um, so I was still apprehensive and wanting to make everything work out well. I'd just gotten another apartment, um, living alone, no roommates. So I, um, I don't recall being risk averse, but fate is an interesting thing. The guy that I worked for quit six months into my job. Now I have no boss. He went off to do a startup, poof, off he goes. And um, that meant that the, the layers, if you will, between myself and uh, an IT leader had sort of, at least for the moment, evaporated. So choice A, wait till the company hires another IT person at that level and I get a new boss. That was an option. That'd be the classic one. Um, the other option, the way I saw it, which is funny when I look back, but anyway, I went into his boss, who was my boss's boss, right? And um, that was a bit, I think, intimidating for me at the time. But it, it goes back to the what have I got to lose mentality, fail my way to success. Now, I genuinely believed that I could do my boss's job, in my mind, anyway. <laughs> and um, so I went in and asked for his job. The few days later, I, um, I said, will you write me a letter of recommendation? I'm going to go ask so-and-so if I can be the interim manager for this department. I don't expect them to hire me and put me into that job permanently. That's a bit of a lofty uh, expectation for someone who just got out of school and has been here six months. Um, but I can hold the fort for 90 days. This was my idea. And if you haven't found anyone in 90 days, um, then I'd like you to put me in the job. If you think I've done a good job, I'd like to take it. This was to the boss's boss. And he was nodding his head. I could see him thinking, you know. And um, I said, there's one more thing. Um, if you could see your way to a 10% raise, I'd appreciate that too, at the end of the 90-day period. So he said, okay, all right, sure, sure, that sounds good, 90 days. So. You have to ask. He could have said no. So what? You know, I was young. I don't really care if you'd have fired me. It wouldn't have mattered. And you shouldn't care either. Because if you care about that, you're not going to find your fullest potential. Because something else is going to be pushing on you. Now, I don't want to sound um, you know, utopian in the sense that I would expect any of us, myself included, to glide through our entire lives with that mentality. In the end, you're going to probably have things pushing on you. Family, you know, the apartment that you have by yourself will become the apartment you have with your wife or husband, right? And then roll through the years. A lot of you will probably have kids um, or other, or dogs or something, and, or, or bigger apartments, or more than one apartment and houses, and all kinds of stuff starts to happen. So then you're thinking, 
at that point, hmm, let me go into my boss's boss. You know, that's going to be a little more heady stuff at that point, right? If they say no, get out of my office. And I do know a guy who, just to temper my, uh, my little story, who was at a big software company. I'll leave the name off because we're being recorded. <laughs> and he was a director. And he was in his 40s. And he always wanted to have that VP title. The title was very important to him. So he came to me and he said, we didn't work at the same company. We were neighbors. And he said, um, I've had it. I've been here 12 years. I deserve to be vice president. I'm going to go in and get that VP title. You know, OK. Uh, I said, you should be careful about that, how you phrase that, to your point. He wasn't very careful about it. He went in and he said, I've been here 12 years, and I've done a great job. And um, it's time for me to be vice president now. I passed over a couple of times, but here I am. And if you guys can't see your way to that, I understand. But I don't, I don't think I can be here much longer, if that's the case. He threatened them. Bad idea. How long do you think he lasted at that company after that meeting? Two weeks. Goodbye. Guess what? Companies can live without you. Of course they can. Any company can. So always think about the win-win situation, to your point. Early on, I was fortunate. My effort at Orange County to advance myself worked. But I did give a lot of outs. I would like to do this. I would like to do it for a short period of time. In that short period of time, if you think I'm doing a good job, then perhaps you would decide to make this permanent for me, because that's what my goal is. If not, that's OK. I am happy to be here doing what I'm doing, delighted, in fact. But I know I can do more, and I can help you because if you don't put me in this position, I didn't say this, but that was the implication, then you have to go search for someone. So what's 90 days? It's nothing. Try me out. If I do really well, I've saved you the cost and time of finding a replacement, and I'm already here, and it's only going to cost you 10% over my very small 1987 salary. Okay? So I think the better answer is try to think about Whatever you do, whether it's something you're going to build or create or design, how does it benefit everyone in, in your universe? How does it benefit yourself? How does it benefit your company or organization? And if things don't work out, you know, what's the exit strategy, right? So have an exit strategy. Don't pin them in the corner like my neighbor did. We saw how that worked out. Maybe okay. that helps. Not a good move. No. Questions? Um, how do you work past the branding issue? As in, you said you were branded. What's the best way to go about uh, brand So how do you work past the branding issue? I, I said that I was branded. And how do you work past that if you're changing your brand, if you will? Is that fair? Um, I think, I mean, in my story, it, you know, I got to the point where I had to create that through my own efforts only. I was spinning my wheels to some extent, or at least in my mind, I, I always have a sense of urgency. It's part of who I am. So waiting around for a year to find the great opportunity in the apparel world um, wasn't really working out in my mind. So to, to overcome the branding issue, start small. That would be my advice. You know, if you can't get a job at, uh, at such and such a company, which catapults you into a different industry at the same level, you have to make a decision, right? One of the decisions you can make is, fine. You know, I'm the ex-e-commerce leader from a 20-some billion dollar company. That gives me a little bit of street credibility. So if I can't penetrate that, that market space here, I'll ratchet down a little bit to a smaller firm or a series of smaller firms. And I'll start to build my experience that way. I mean, think of it like interning when you're in school. I mean, uh, any internship is a great internship, of course. But if you're lucky enough and you're passionate enough and you found something that you really like at this stage of your life, you could do internship, internship, internship. And they could all be in the same industry. 
And then you have the, the makings of, of your brand starting out when you graduate. That doesn't change 10 years later either. If you're going from one industry to another, you have to build your credibility through your actions as best you can. And at some point, the um, critical mass of that is large enough to where it's recognized by the industry that you're seeking to be a part of. Mm -hmm. uh, any other questions? Oh. Mitchell in Orange County to Honeywell. Was it more money or the fear of branding? Or did you just want to take that risk to go into the private industry? Uh, that's a really great question, and I actually appreciate you asking that so because it allows me to talk about that a little bit. Um, I fundamentally, as, as a philosophy, embrace capitalism um, completely. So as a result of that inner fire of, you know, uh, capitalist attraction, if you will. Um, when I went to Orange County, Orange County was um, a very, very positive means to an end for me. It was the opportunity to start from scratch in a computing environment that would have scalability that could be huge because Orange County is a very big county with lots of moving parts. So. Originally, I didn't think I'd be there very long. I thought I'd be there a couple of years, build this thing, and boing, you know, jump off into commercial world. But as the growth of this county was so explosive at that time, it was one of those, I'll do that next year. I'll leave next year. I'll leave next year. I'll leave next year. Because we were doing such amazing things with such amazing funding and giving back such amazing return on investment to everything that we were doing, it was pretty heady stuff. So it was sort of like, whoa, you better wake up. I know you're having a lot of fun, but if you have fun too much longer, you know, to your question, you're going to brand yourself, Eric. And that was the advice from one of my mentors. Like it or not, that's the way it is. Now, the second part of your question was, was it money? Was it this? Was it that? Yes, it was money. I'm not going to lie. Absolutely, it, money had a lot to do with it, but fundamentally, philosophically, it was the real driver. But the real driver of someone who embraces capitalism and all of its tenets, and that's a whole other subject, um, you know, financial gain is, a, is an inherent aspect of creating great products. So that was all part of it, really. Um, I hope that helps, but yeah. I like business a lot. <laughs> we'll get two more, and then I think we've got to wrap. How do you go about developing the relationships? It looks like the relationships are really important for driving these differences and changes that will occur in your life. So how do you go about developing relationships? Um, you know, I think the, the shortest and, and best answer to that is always be thinking the win-win, right? Because the other person whoever they may be, both of you have something to gain or lose in, in the, um, the beginning of a relationship and then sustaining the relationship. So you'll see a lot of people like at last night's event or at any event that are uh, seasoned professionals always networking, but not necessarily completely overtly, hi, I'm Bob, hi, I'm you know, John or Mary, this is what I do. Who knows if there's, there's something there but at least you're sharing who you are and what you're doing um, with one another. And if you, if you don't have that seasoned background and you're graduating, then I think the answer is, hi, I'm Eric, I'm just graduating from, from here. These are my interests, these are my ideas, these are my passions. One of the people in your circle that you keep building, actually more than one, will start to resonate with that and say, really, I'm interested in mobile too. In fact, over here, we're doing this thing. What do you think about that? And then it's up to you to say, I think that's interesting. Let's talk more. I mean, you know, there's a little bit of that taking the initiative and asking. And that goes back to hopefully the earlier message I was trying to convey is you really have to ask. Asking is one of the single most important things. If I can leave you with that, it's really that simple. So many people are intimidated. They get nervous. They don't 
ask, whether it's asking to meet someone or asking to learn more about them or their business, offering what you can do, asking if that might be of importance or interest to them, and then keeping that going. I hope that makes sense because you'd be amazed how simple yet uh, undone this, this one act can be. <laughs> It's a really, yeah, it's, it's some good questions here. They're uh, going deep into my psyche. <laughs> it's easier to take risk now for all of you, right? You have less to lose. You have almost nothing to lose. It becomes harder as you're becoming more and more successful to take the risks to a point. The risks change, but you have more to lose. So it's a very interesting question because I've been asking that of myself lately which is I've had to rely on you know, my own career history to help me keep pushing where the edge is. That, and that's, this is, I'm being very open here. When you're doing well in your career and you've reaped the benefits of that, it's very easy to be seduced into complacency oh, you know, I've done pretty well. I don't really have to find the edge anymore, if you will. I don't have to push myself. Why, I could drift off into complacency over here and no one will even notice because I'm running this thing or I'm doing this at this level and all I have to do is keep the machine humming. Average is great. That's all they're going to care about. I don't have to keep breaking it and pushing it forward. But if your philosophy is that, which mine is inside here, then you're letting yourself down. You're not being who you are. This is me talking, right? So I feel that part of who I am as an engineer and as a business person is someone who wants to always never be completely satisfied. Because the minute you throttle down and accept the average or the mediocre as good enough, you can just start writing your exit papers in business and start imagining which one of your competitors is about to be in the number one spot and evaporate your very existence. Because that's the nature of business. It's every second, all the time, after hours and during hours, people that are leading those businesses and the people that are in them are thinking about, how do I make this better? And how do you make it better? Not by being average. It's by taking chances. Think of every product you've ever bought or everything you've ever experienced that really energized you. It really came from someone or some team taking a huge chance. So to answer your question, is it harder to keep doing that as your career goes on? Yes, I believe it is. Because you've gained things that are valuable and you're putting more of them on the line when you continue to pursue this strategy. The flip side is, if you don't do that, you may have a nice, comfortable existence, but in my opinion, you won't be doing what you need to be doing to be a pioneer and make a change. You know, Steve Jobs, is one of his most famous quotes is, I want to make a dent in the universe, and he did, and he's remarkable, was remarkable. I think all of us can make that little dent. And there's lots of examples of people that went through their whole careers never stopping doing that. So it's harder, but it's also hard to stop. <laughs> so Eric talked about fate. There's fate while you're here today. Okay. Don't know what it is. I know what it is for me because I know where I'm going next week. I'm going away for a week, right? I'm going through that. Mm -hmm. And I've got to be going to be head shaped. These folks are going to make choices pretty soon. Here's what I heard. Write these down if you missed them. Engineering is cool. It's Extremely about making cool. a difference. <laughs> Engineering is portable. I'm going to get out of the mic thing. 
It's about what defines you. What can I build? What can I impact? What am I dreaming about becoming? And do we step back enough and say, and look, and are we feeling good about ourselves and what we're doing? Are we making a dent? I'm not sure. I am sure. He made a dent today. Thank you very Thanks. much. Thanks. Thank you.